Well, welcome to tonight's HBF. I wonder if we could just launch straight into, I'm sure you've already done your uh, teas and coffees and catching up and whatever else you've been doing, but I wonder if we can just start off by maybe thinking about uh, the theme for tonight being Jacob and his family as we kind of bring that to a conclusion in terms of their wandering and the events that uh, happened with them. I wonder if we can just start off instead of roses and thorns, you can do that if you want. But why not ask a question? What is a significant event that happened in your family's life over the past two weeks? Um, significant, what's the most significant thing? Um, challenge, highlight, something like that. Something fresh and new uh, that maybe people don't realize or know about. Well, this evening we're going to be looking at the passage that I was unpacking on Sunday morning, which is Genesis 35 and 36. Now, you'll be glad I didn't spend too much time in Genesis 36, which is the the um, genealogy of Esau. Now, that's kind of a, a, a generous gesture to Esau and his descendants um, and giving them significance there. But it bookends that passage, that whole portion of Genesis in the life of Jacob. Next uh, Sunday, we'll be beginning to look into the life of Jacob's children, particularly Joseph. But why not read Genesis 35 together? Maybe take a couple of verses each and go round like that. And just think as you're reading, what words or phrases stand out? What memory comes back to you from Sunday morning's sermon as you read around Genesis 35 through to the first uh, eight verses of 36? What is your alarm clock sound? Mine's is the classic iPhone uh, alarm clock sound, but I've heard others use it for their ringtone and it's irritating when you hear it playing. Uh, but I opened up on Sunday morning uh, with the, the, the sound of that shofar horn, that annoying screeching sound of the horn that's meant to serve as a wake up call, a wake up call to get up, to be alert, to uh, change your um, focus from either being distracted or sleeping to repentance and getting right with God. And so at, at the beginning of this um, Rosh Hashanah, this new year for the Jewish people, this is what they're playing in Jerusalem just now. And thinking about this passage, the big kind of idea going on is that God is waking up Israel, Jacob and his family, uh, for a time of renewal, a time of repentance and revival as they begin to enter and settle in the promised land. And so thinking about us, this is what we're thinking about tonight, is how does God wake us up, make us alert to issues that have crept in to our life as he desires to bring about repentance and renewal and revival in our lives. So maybe break for just a minute here and just Share about things that are wake-up calls, situations, events, things that have served to wake you up to a danger or to a drift in your spiritual life. You'll remember last Sunday, Aaron was looking at how, well, Jacob and his family had settled there in Shechem and, and it had brought real trouble on the family. Um... Dina had been defiled, the brothers had rose up to avenge her uh, defilement and there was murder, there was uh, chaos and then there was fear from the opposing nations around them. And here in the first couple of verses of our passage in 35, God reminds Jacob that they are supposed to be heading into the promised land and they need to get moving again. And so I was kind of looking at the first couple of uh, points on Sunday morning being that we need to recognize our need for God before revival. Just like they recognized there were serious issues in the family and that they needed to get right with God. And um, they needed to respond to that. And so they did that by beginning to move. They began the journey south. So I wonder for us, what things are we needing to be alert for in our own spiritual life? What things have crept in? What places have we got stuck at? Looking back on our spiritual journey, have we become stagnant? In what ways is our spiritual life um, 
connected to the study and the obeying and the honouring of God's word. God speaks to Jacob here and asks him to get moving. Um, but what about us? What's God saying to us and how do we uh, respond to that? One of the points was that we need to remove spiritual hindrances that stop us uh, experiencing revival. We need to repent of them and put them away. And a clear example of that in this passage is, is Jacob calling his family to uh, gather in the idols that they had collected, whether that was uh, Rachel and the idols that she'd brought from uh, Uncle Laban, or whether that was um, things that they had plundered from Shechem. I wonder for us, I was looking at syncretism, this sort of worship of God plus other things that we put our trust in or our hope in. What about us? What things came to mind when you listened to that sermon? What things did you put in uh, in place of trusting in when it should be God alone? I've had several people kind of comment and, uh, and share them with me uh, since yesterday morning, saying things like, well, I live alone and and I've recognised that there's a slippery slope for alcohol. Uh, drinking a tipple on a night or whatever is the beginning of a slippery slope. And these are hindrances that can creep in, I recognise, can creep in really quickly in my life. And so that person there shared particularly how they need to put that aside and leave that behind as they move on in their spiritual journey. But what about you? What are the spiritual hindrances uh, and how do you identify them? in your life. Really throughout this whole passage in chapter 35, there are a series of trials and troubles. Uh, there's death, there is problems. But amidst all of that, there's also sweet moments of victory. Think of Jacob and Esau having been reconciled and together burying the tragic death of their father. They, they were able to do that and mourn his death together. So there's a mixture of both. And, and we recognised how um, these moments and trials in our life can both serve to hinder us in worship and draw us away from God, like Satan tried to do with Job, for example. Or they can serve to be a catalyst in our worship, like Jacob did here in this passage. When there were things that happened and deaths happened, he, he raised this tower of stones and made a, a, an offering, a drink offering uh, on it and called that place no longer just Bethel, the house of God, but El Bethel, the, the God of the house of God. And, and it became a place of worship to God in that place. So what about us? How do we worship God in light of some of the challenges and situations, in light of some of the hindrances that we identify I uh, I was talking about how we need to recall moments of grace and how God reminds Jacob of where he had called him from and where he was calling him to go. I read this quote that was really helpful in us uh, thinking through this. It says, we need to learn to think differently. If we are as good, if we were as good at remembering the good times in our life as we are replaying the hearts, we would be so much better off. We are prone to nurse a grudge and forget a kindness. We dwell on a failure but dismiss a victory. And as a result, things get distorted. When our spiritual lives begin to feel stale and unfruitful, we need to take a trip back to Bethel. This recommendation here is this. Remember the day that you met Christ and how your life changed because of him. Recount the circumstances and the people that God used to lead you to his grace. Reread a book that stirred your soul. Compare who you are now with who you used to be. Walk through the church and remember special times that you've had in various rooms. Review some of your favourite passages. Recall the spiritual teachers that have impacted you. And it closes by saying, looking back and gaining perspective is only one step in the process, but it's an valuable and important step. So, what about these moments of worship? What about these recollections of grace? Why don't share uh, for a few minutes things that come to your mind and how that can stir you up in your worship? So in closing, uh, we looked at that beautiful echo of um, 
the delivery of this boy, Ben Oni, or as Jacob renamed him Ben Jamin, uh, son of my right hand. So as Rachel entered into Ephrath, this place that is Bethlehem, that later would be a place where um, Jesus, the Messiah, was born, uh, we see this echo here in Genesis of a son of the right hand being born, entering into Bethlehem. And so thinking of that beautiful echo, what ways is this scripture pointing you in your worship of Jesus? Because this does point to Jesus, the one who suffered the trial for us, the one who endured for us in order that we might win the blessing on the other side. What about this? What is Jesus saying to you and how do you respond in light of these things that we've been talking about tonight.